Hey, so in our last screencast, we looked at levels of organization. We said that if we wanted to study the human body, uh, we really need to start with atoms because they are the basic building blocks of all things, not just living, but all things at all. Um, and then we combine those into molecules. We combine molecules into cells. We combine cells into tissues. And then we started to look at um, different types of tissues, focusing um, in the last screencast on epithelial tissue. So today we're going to look at a second uh, type of tissue. In this case, it's connective tissue. Um, and then hopefully round out that sort of flow map of levels of organization of studying the human body. So um, connective tissue, um, as you might expect, connective tissue connects things. It, it connects, supports, binds, or separates other tissues or organs. It's just kind of, it's kind of the mortar that holds the whole body together. Um, it's a very diverse group of tissues. And the thing that really unites all of the different uh, types of connective tissue are, is its structure. Um, it has this unique structure where it consists of cells embedded in what is called a matrix. Now, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to give you an analogy. So um, I'd like you to picture Jello. And um, every now and then I have a student who doesn't know what Jello is. I remember I had a foreign exchange student from uh she was from another country and in other countries they eat you know actual food and so they don't really know what things like jello are um and so i had to explain it so if you're not familiar with what jello is maybe google it real quick um but i want you to picture jello and um and in particular jello with fruit chunks dissolved in it so good with a little veneer of whipped cream amazing if you don't like jello your opinion is wrong um so here's a picture of of what it looks like you've got these little fruit chunks embedded in this mass of jello and this is kind of a good analogy for what connective tissue is like it sells in my analogy these fruit chunks embedded in a matrix which in my analogy is this jello so you've got this material with cells kind of embedded in it um, another analogy would be to think of it like like houses um, in epithelial tissue, if you look back at those pictures we were playing around with yesterday, uh, with the last screencast, um, you'll find those cells are really stacked next to each other, right? House, 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 um, in layers sometimes, but they're really packed. So that's kind of like a suburban or an urban setting. The houses are really close together. In connective tissue, it's more like a rural setting where you've got maybe a house, in this case a farm, and then a whole lot of space and then another house and then a whole lot of space and then another house. In this analogy, um, all this space would be the matrix, and then these little farms would be the cells. So the cells are just more spaced out in connective tissue, and then there's this other stuff between them. So let's go and look at the different types. So the first type is what is called loose connective tissue. And this is responsible for holding your organs in place and connecting your skin to the underlying muscle. Now, in this case, the matrix are little protein fibers. So the cells are these purple dots. They're called fibroblasts. And those cells produce these fibers. And there's different types of fibers. There's elastin, there's collagen, there's other fibers. But all these little thread-like things are protein fibers. Um, and it's called loose because there's just kind of this, you know, tangled mesh. It's not, you know, very well organized, these protein fibers. So, um so it turns out that uh, there's two major types of fibers that I want to talk about. Collagen fibers provide strength and elastin fibers provide stretchiness. Now, you may be wondering, why do we care about this? But this is a hugely important type of tissue. Again, it holds everything in place. So imagine that, you know, you go to... Uh, uh, a dance and you know in this era of social distancing you're six feet away from all your friends and you're jumping around um, imagine your heart as you're jumping around the dance floor if there was nothing holding your heart in place it would be boom, 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 boom. it'd be like bouncing all over the place and it would mash up against your rib cage and become damaged quite easily so this connective tissue is kind of holding those organs in place uh, when we do dissection um, you actually have to cut away a lot of this connective tissue to expose the different organs because it's holding them all in place. This is really important. Um, another place you could see it, if you can look at my hand in the little picture in the in the corner there. Um, but, uh, ooh, oh, maybe not. All right. Um, if you just pinch a little bit of skin up like that and then let go, you'll notice that your skin kind of 
snaps back in place, right? So that is, again, loose connective tissue that's holding your skin onto your underlying muscle. So, um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so it turns out that sunlight is not good to your loose connective tissue. Sunlight can actually damage this loose connective tissue, which has some interesting effects. So to illustrate this, I'm going to show you two pictures here. Uh, the first is a 91-year-old Japanese monk who spent most of his life indoors away from the sun. The next is a 62-year-old Native American woman who spent most of her life outdoors. Check out these pictures. Notice how smooth his skin is in comparison to hers. And he's 30 years older than her, 29 really. Um, what is the deal? Well, it turns out that sunlight damages that loose connective tissue. Remember, the loose connective tissue is what holds your skin on. And so as that gets damaged, all of a sudden, it isn't, doesn't hold to your face as well, and it starts to sag a little bit, and that's what gives you wrinkles. So sunlight actually contributes to the formation of wrinkles. So if you're someone who likes to go lay out in the sun and get exposure to, to tan yourself, this is likely to be your future sooner rather than later. Um, if you wear your sunscreen and your big old sombrero and, you know, the little patch of white goop on your nose when you go out, then you'll look like him. So, you know, make your choice, I guess. Um, here's another interesting illustration of this. Um, notice half his face is clear and half is, is smooth and half is wrinkly. He was a truck driver for about 25 years. And so this was the side of his face that faced the window. And so it got a lot more damage and therefore wrinkly than this side. So that's kind of interesting. Wear your sunscreen, children. Um, oh, another fun thing you can do, remember this trick? Get your your a parent and a grandparent. You basically need you, an old person, and a really old person, and just let go. Your skin will like snap back instantaneously. Your parents, I'm kind of in that category. Well, it'll take there'll just be a little delay where you can kind of see it. And your your old old person, I did this with my grandma once. She let go and nothing happened. It stayed as if she was still pinching. I I went made myself a sandwich, caught a movie, went bowling, came back, and then it finally went brew down. So um, that's just another illustration of this. Okay, another type of connective tissue, fibrous connective tissue, is found mainly in your tendons and ligaments. Um, in this case, the the matrix are these parallel collagen fibers. Um, and the cells, again, are these fibroblasts. So now instead of loose connective tissue that um, the, the proteins are all kind of tangled up, here they're nice and densely packed in smooth layers. Um, by the way, what is the difference between a tendon and a ligament? I don't know if you know this or not, but a tendon connects muscle to bone. So they're this little white band of fibers, and this is what it would look like, fibrous connective tissue at a microscopic level and it connects your muscle to your bone. I always think of my Achilles tendon, and if you just feel your calf muscle kind of slide down towards your ankle, you'll kind of feel that little band of uh, tendon there. And then ligaments connect bone to bone. So both have this very densely packed protein fibers making it up. Um, you may have heard that tendons and ligaments take a long time to heal if they're injured. And that is true. And the reason why is because the cells are spaced really far apart. So it's kind of like an, uh, a rural setting. You can imagine if there was a fire um, in one of these homes, then it's going to take emergency services a long time to get there because there's not as many roads going the place. Things are just further apart. Same here. These cells are really far apart. So if you like tear this way over here, the cells who are responsible for repairing that damage are far away. There's not a rich blood supply because the cells are so spaced apart. And as a result, it just takes a really long time to heal tendons and ligaments. Adipose tissue is next. It stores fat. And interesting little fun fact, the number of fat cells doesn't typically change after puberty, only their size. Um, and then, you know, here's, I'm not sure why I have this here, but just people store fat in different ways. And, you know, men tend to store it more in their belly and, and uh, women tend to store it more on their hips and in the breasts. And this kind of shows where that fat is stored. Um, cartilage is next. Cartilage consists of cells embedded in a flexible carbohydrate matrix. 
Um, so the key is flexibility. I think you've heard of cartilage. You don't need to memorize these different types, but here's just some figures that kind of show where they are. We've already, um, <clears throat> oh, actually we haven't talked about that. The soft spot of a baby, uh, for example, is cartilage. So when a baby's born, there's cartilage that kind of uh, is in between the different bones of their skull. The bones of their skull haven't fused yet. Your nose is a very typical place to feel cartilage, that kind of flexibility of your nose. Your ears are cartilage, um, things like that. You've got cartilage at the end of your of your bones. Um, uh, your, uh, your vertebrae have cartilage in between them. Even your hips. So there's a little bit of cartilage right there between the hips. And this has a very interesting function. I'm so sorry, ladies, this is gonna traumatize you a bit, but this is there for childbirth. So during childbirth, the baby has to fit through that opening in the pelvis. And as a result, this little bit of cartilage provides some flexibility so that the pelvis can kind of flex outward ever so slightly. And then because the baby's skull bones have infused and it's cartilage, their, their skull kind of like flexes through there a little bit as well. This is why some babies come out as cone heads. It's a tight fit. And so cartilage really is what's enabling that baby to pass out through those hips. And then at this point, usually a student will ask, well, so do men have that cartilage? And um, it turns out men do have that band of cartilage, but it's kind of like our nipples. It's for decorative purposes only. It serves no function. Um, bone is next. Uh, in the case of bone, the matrix is, uh, it's cells embedded in a matrix, but the matrix now is, is minerals. So there actually are little cells. You maybe see these little kind of, I don't know, kind of grayish blobby things there. Those are the location of cells. And then this is hard rock-like mineral. Um, embedded in there. And so here again, these kind of orangish things are cells and they're all embedded in this mineral. There's cells that migrate through there. Um, we're gonna talk a lot more about bone later in the course. Blood is actually a connective tissue. It does sort of bind and connect and, and uh, merge things together. In this case though, the liquid uh, or the, the matrix is a liquid. So you can actually, uh, if you take blood and put it in a centrifuge, it like spins it really, really fast. The cells that are in that blood, red blood cells, white blood cells, these things called platelets, they all pack down to the bottom. And then you have this liquid on top. That is called plasma. And that is the matrix for this connective tissue. It fits our definition of cells embedded in a matrix. We'll talk more about blood later. So, um, so far we've talked about epithelial tissue. Now we've talked about connective tissue. This is a third type of tissue and it's called muscle tissue. So again, this is where that study guide outline is really useful to kind of see how ideas are organized. This is not another type of connective tissue. It's a whole new category of tissue, muscle tissue. And here's what I wanna tell you about muscle tissue at this point, it exists. We're gonna do a whole unit on muscles later and get to know muscles. So for now, we'll just kind of mention it to be complete. And the same with nervous tissue it exists. These uh, nervous tissue makes up your brain, your spinal cord, um, and our next unit, we're going to look at that in much more detail. So for now, it exists. So that brings us back to this diagram. Atoms, molecules you learned about in chemistry, cells you learned about in biology, um, and then tissues, we just went through those four major types. And so now for the rest of this course, we're going to focus on the rest of this flow map. If you take tissues, group them together, you get an organ, if you take a bunch of organs, group them together, you get an organ system. And if you take organ systems together, you get an organism. In this course, organ systems will be our, our organizing principle. We're gonna kind of go through system by system and get to know them. And here's just kind of a list of those systems. And they're kind of broken down by when the tests will be, so to speak. So we kind of do two systems at a time. Final thing I want to point out about how the body is organized, you actually have body cavities, these little spaces where organs are suspended. Um, for example, your, your brain is in the cranial cavity here, the spinal cord down here. You have a chest cavity, an abdominal cavity, and they're separated by a diaphragm, which is this muscle that just kind of separates the chest and abdomen from one another. We're gonna look more at the diaphragm later. Um, the reason I wanna point these out is to indicate what a hernia is. A hernia is when an organ or tissue bulges through a weakness in the body wall. And so you can get this little bulge poking through that weakness and stick out. 
I'm out of time, so we're going to leave that as foreshadowing. And in the next screencast, we'll talk about what a hernia is. Thanks.